Chris, can you hear me? Sorry about that. I was trying to get back to my mute button. Yes, I have you. You sound good. There's no one in the waiting room. Uh, well, I mean, I should be in from the other PC. Hmm. I'd say we're live. Why you're not you're not seeing anybody in? You should see. No. Um, at least me. That's weird. Uh, let's let's do this. Let's ask um, if some of the attendees can. Uh, oh yeah, we got oh, some we got, comments right now. Perfect. Yeah, so we're fine. Go live. <laughs> oh, we're live. Sorry, I did not see any uh, people come in. So. Hello, everyone. Hello, Cinemeric Nation. This is Dan Struble. We're coming with our webinar series, and we got an interesting topic here and kind of a different host. So normally, Chris has been the host and bringing on guests, and I'm going to be the host today bringing on Chris. So we are going to kind of go through some things before I introduce our speaker today, who is Chris. So we're going to talk about Machinum. This is kind of our new platform of digitalization and some virtual things. And we're going to talk about a piece of software called Run My Virtual Machine, the demo version. This is kind of cool because it's a free version that you can download and you can utilize this on your PC. I think it's huge. I even think just this demo version is a step in the right direction for your shop or any your manufacturing needs to go towards a digital twin so before we get that i just wanted to kind of who we are and what we are about and our team so i work for chris who's going to give the pre presentation on the demo which is the technical application team and what we do and what we're kind of our initiative is is to kind to educate the market and the market space on why siemens for cinemeric so why should you choose the cinemeric control and what are the benefits for that so that we can kind of show you how to use the technology so our team is new and it's growing we have a lot of experience though on our team, although being new to Siemens as a team, we have definitely a lot of years underneath our belt. Kind of resides of three people right now. We have <clears throat> myself who sits in Illinois at the DEX or TAC, which we would call Technical Application Center. And then Chris who sits in the VTAC in New York. He has a virtual TAC with machines there to do virtual webinars and demonstrations. And then Brian Baumgartner, who's also in New York, who has just recently added to the team from an engineering standpoint that gives us the commissioning side of things. Some resources before we get into it. Obviously, we have the webinar that we are going to go through today. This is something that we try to bring to the table on a mass scale to kind of describe how we can utilize the things inside Siemens and Cinemeric. So one of the biggest things is go to CNC for you, sign up to be in our webinars uh, for the upcoming ones, as well as on that same website, CNC for you, we have training classes. So we have an online class that runs every month, as well as quarterly in-person classes like five axis or high speed machining class to we have a level four macro class that we run quarterly. So definitely a lot of training there, not only from a program and operation standpoint, well, we also have service classes too. So we have a Cinemeric service class. So you have some people that want to understand the machine from a service standpoint, we can definitely train you on that, as well as understanding how to maintenance. So that would be kind of a, a kind of a twofold. So you got some maintenance guys in your shop want to look learn how to back up the control, troubleshoot some of the things that might be happening in, in the electrical cabinet or for on our control. We definitely give you the tools in that training. So definitely huge sign up there. So here's what it would look like. You have in-person, which would be the in-person trainings, which would be the level three, five axis class and the, the service class, as well as we have online training. <clears throat> Next resource that we have is Mr. CNC. If you haven't gone there and subscribe or like any of the videos, please go after this webinar, subscribe to the channel. This is what we 
put all our webinars on and any future videos that we're going to put on go on to Mr. CNC. This is something that we want to kind of have a suppository of all the information that we've kind of done over the years and put it on this so that you guys can go there if you want to find out how to adjust your angled head or how to touch a tool off or or how to calibrate your probe. So we just did a YouTube live last week. Chris came out to Chicago. We were uh, together and we did a YouTube live on how to calibrate a probe. That's already up there on our on our Mr. CNC. So this is a good resource for it. If you watched every video in our channel, you would be a Siemens guru. So this is a really, really powerful uh, source for information. Lastly, is we have the virtual product expert. The virtual product expert was developed a couple of years ago. This is to kind of from any programming or operation standpoint that you have any questions that you can go to this uh, website under CNC for you, click on virtual product expert, enter in all your information and your question, and we will then contact you you with the team's meeting to kind of go over your situation, find out what, what is needed and put you in touch with either someone from our team or someone inside Siemens that can definitely filter those questions. Then lastly is we're not shy of putting any of our manuals up on the internet for download. So we have definitely the, um, website support industry Siemens. If you want to know about anything, you know, you want to learn about measuring cycles, go to this site, type in the search bar measuring cycles, you'll get manuals, you get um, um, questions and frequently asked questions on this. So there's a lot of information that we're not shy of. We post everything up on this website for our manuals. And then who am I? I'm Dan Struble. I'm in charge of the Technical Application Center in Illinois. Here's my contact information. But this webinar is going to be about my virtual machine, the demo version, and Chris is going to be the one that is going to present this in this webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chris. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for coming on and giving us this topic. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for um... Uh, introducing me and, and setting up the uh, the audience for what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, so you guys should uh, should now have my screen. Uh, we're going to talk about the more Machinum product portfolio. So Machinum is a, kind of a new branding on something we've been really kind of market leaders in for some time now, which is the digitalization product portfolio. Um, so that is kind of our answer to how we support Industry 4.0. Um, and, you know, that progression that all these manufacturers and then end users are doing to try to really try to streamline their, their operations, right? So Run My Virtual Machine demo version, as Dan mentioned, is under the Machinum umbrella. So that's why I did want to make reference to it, as well as a lot of additional products. So really, from the Machinum perspective, it is a way for us to kind of, you know, look at challenging areas. Um, where we think we can streamline and help um, end users or manufacturers. So there's pieces of the products that kind of fit both sides of the manufacturing arena. So if you're a machine builder, we certainly have machinum products um, that can kind of aid in, in streamlining your process. Same thing with end users. Now, what is um, worth noting, you may, you may expect that the products that we have under the machine and portfolio are specific to cinematic controls, but that is not always actually the case. So we understand that our customer base has a typically has a blend and a mix of controls. Would we love you guys to have 100% Cinemark on your shop floor? Absolutely. And Dan and I are going to keep on pushing that, and hopefully we can get there someday. But the reality is we know. There's there's plenty of Fanatec, high 9 mitts, you know, any number of captive controls. So we are trying to address that, that if you are going to bring in a solution into the shop, it's not only going to work on the Cinemark. So some of the products you're going to see here uh, in the next slide, uh, they will support multiple control platforms. Um, but I will say since we develop it around Cinemaric, that certainly you tend to get the most bang for your buck capabilities and power with the Cinemaric controls. But um, it is a potential solution. 
So what is kind of under that? Well, we usually focus on three areas. We have what we call the smart shop floor, smart virtual machine, and then smart machine. Um, and really it comes down to the smart shop floor is all the products in the portfolio that are doing data management. Right. So here's a few, you know, manage my resources, analyze my performance. But when we're moving large chunks of data between the machines back into uh, into the office and, and back and forth, there's a bunch of products under that portfolio. The smart virtual machine, that's where the run my virtual machine comes in. So those are really our digital twins, allowing you to hopefully increase your utilization of your machine tool by offloading a lot of the process steps that would maybe keep that machine from running into a virtual environment using the digital twin like you're going to see here today with run my virtual machine and then smart machine those are more products that will optimize a specific machine or task or application so if you're familiar with familiar with our acm adaptive control and monitoring piece of software that would be found under that smart machine environment but without further ado, let us dig into the smart virtual machine world. Now we do have two flavors. We have the create my virtual machine. As I mentioned, we have some tools that are spe more specific to machine tool OEMs, integrators, retrofitters. That would really be more the create. That allows you to effectively build an entire machine in the virtual world before you ever actually started putting that, the nuts and bolts together. And then we have the Run My Virtual Machine, which we're concentrating on today, that is really designed for the end user in mind. So when we're down on that manufacturing floor, or at least in that manufacturing environment, and we want to be able to now take this digital twin of the machine and actually check to see, will our parts process through properly? Are we going to run into any problems as we go? That's where I would leverage the Run My Virtual Machine. Now, the demo version is um, brand new for us. We, it's only been released uh, maybe a couple months now. It's, it is quite new. Um, and what it is, is it's going to now give you the ability of playing with this software before you actually purchase a license. So traditionally, prior to the quote unquote demo version, you had to have a license to be able to run the software. So we're going to talk about, you know, what are the, the caveats to that? What are the, where, you know, what do you get in the demo versus the real? Um, what I will tell you, it's the exact same software. So if you go and you download the demo version, like I'm going to describe here now, set it up on your system, you like it, it makes sense, and you want to buy a license, all you have to do is get the actual license. You don't have to reinstall the software. You plug the license in, and the software is smart enough to realize, now I have a licensed product, and it opens you up to the full capabilities of the software. So if I want to get it, Easiest place to go would be our CNC for you website. The link is right there on the screen. From there, you're going to come down to CNC software where it says virtu my virtual machine, and then you go to the infos and download. So it's really as simple as that. Just click on our main website. I'll pull over my browser. Once it refreshes, if you scroll down, there's a few things you can get here. You know, Dan was talking about our training. That's all found right here in this little training tab. But from the Run My Virtual Machine, that's going to be found right there under CNC software. So you click on Run My Virtual Machine, and now we're really into the next screen. And this is where I can kind of see an overview of the software. Um, and then I can come in and actually request the software. So you would go to bum, 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 Info and Download right here. And this is where you can get your software. So I'm going to jump back to our slides real quick. And we'll kind of step you through what that process looks like. So once you go to the info downloads, you will give us your basic information. Now there is this little checkbox at the bottom that asks you if you would like to opt in for marketing information. You do not have to opt in if you want to get the software. Um, if you do opt in, what you're going to see is in the next screen, you would just get a little opt-in email that you acknowledge. But you, even before you accept that email, you can immediately start downloading the software once you've filled out this page. So once the page is filled out, you're going to get this download this document. And I, I know the terminology sounds a little funny, but this is what you have to click to get the software. So if you did opt-in, you will see an email come through 
that you have to just confirm your email address and then it tells you you're fully registered. Uh, that way you're going to get correspondence from us. But additionally, if you just click that download and that click here, what it's going to do is it's going to pull down a zip file. And that zip file, what you're going to do is you're going to take the file, save it somewhere locally on your PC. I usually just throw it on my desktop, unzip it, and you're going to see three pieces of software. So you're going to have Run My Virtual Machine. This is what I like to refer to as our, our workbench. So in the Sinew Train days, uh, anybody that's on the call that maybe had a chance to use Sinew Train, we had that one screen where you had all your machine environments, and then you could launch different machines from there. We called it the workbench. This is effectively the exact same thing. Then you're going to install the CNC software. So this is what gives you the control software and all the benefits of that software in your system. And then you do need to install what we call the template machines. So I don't really think there's a, an issue with order, but I always go in that order. I, In my mind, it makes more sense to put the workbench in because once I have the workbench, then I can have the CNC software. It seemed a bit silly to put in template machines before you have the software. So that's the, the process I use. Run, then software, then template machines. There will be a couple reboots and whatnot as you go through the process like any software install. But once you have it, then we can start working with it. Now, what are you going to get? So if you do not have a full license and you're running in demo mode, you're going to get access to the three machines that specifically say demo in their name. And that is a three-axis mill, which we're going to play around with today. You have a five-axis mill. That's an AC kinematic. And then there's a traditional two-axis style lathe, uh, but it does have a positioning C-axis or positioning spindle and live tooling. So it's more of an advanced uh, lathe. So those three machines are fully functional, meaning I can import programs, I can export programs. The only thing you lose in the demo is the ability of saving your state. So it always goes back to kind of a new state. So we're going to talk about that more um, as we kind of progress down. But these would be your three machines that you will have available to you. So when you've launched it and you run it, we're going to bring up the software here just in a second and show you how to do it. You are going to have the ability of now creating a new project. So you'll see a list under new project. Remember, the machines with demo are available to you. So you see all those other template machines, you would require a full license to be able to, to access them. So if you tried to launch one, it would just tell them you don't have a license at this time. Do you want to go to the license screen? And then no, there's no point in doing that. You would have to secure a license. Now on your first launch, you are going to see this little pop-up come up. Um, I can't show you because I've already satisfied it because I've already installed the software. But when you first install it, it's going to tell you there's a communication setting access point is incorrect. Just say yes. It's going to pop up this little sub screen. And what you'll see is both access point one and two are going to be blank. So all you have to do is satisfy the first access point. So click on your little pull down and it's going to show you all of your network devices on your PC. You can pick any one you want. It doesn't matter. You just have to satisfy this. Now, later, if you do get a license, this device is actually going to be linked to your license file. Um, so if you, you know what is your specific network card inside of your PC, I would choose that one because normally that's what we link the license to. But for demo, it really makes no difference. Just pick any one, say OK. Once you've done that, you're going to get a firewall pop up or two. That's normal with any software allow your access, and then you will be running. And when you're running, you can now start to create machines and launch machines. So let's go through the create process real quick, and then we'll talk about running the physical machines. So let me bring up my software. So I've previously just launched the icon that's on my desktop. Once it gets installed, you do have a, an icon there. It launches up Run My Virtual Machine. And now I can create a machine. So it's going to be blank initially. So you click on create a new project. And when I do that, hello, there's the pop-up. You see, as I look in the screen, I have a Sinumil 3 demo. I have the Sinumil 3 plus 2 demo. And if I scroll down a little bit, I have the DT demo. 
So those are your three machines. So pick any one of the three and say create. And it's going to create it automatically in this folder. This folder gets created when you install the software. You can have it point to other areas. Um, in the demo, it really makes no difference because it's always going to kind of rebuild. So there's not a huge benefit of having multiples of the same machine type. In this case, I had one previously. I'm just going to let it wipe it out. It's going to write over top of it. Now, the first time you've created it, you're going to see this is interim screen. Um, but then later, we're going to get back once I've, you know, shut the machine down or whatnot. You'll get back down to your workbench. And now you'll see that one machine here. Um, so had I built a second one, like I maybe I wanted to pick the, the lathe, right? I create that project. It always shows me this interim screen when I first built it the first time. Uh, but then I have an option once I've already done it. So we'll talk about that. But now if I shut down, I'm using this little NCX button. That shuts the machine down and pops me back to the workbench. This little green button actually starts and stops the physical machine, just like a, on a real machine, just your, your power on button. So if I click on this little X, it brings me back to the table. And now you see I have two machines in my library. So the most in the demo world um, I would ever really need to have here is the three machines. And then I can go into any three of them as I want. Now I want to launch them. I'm going to be highlighting the machine I want to launch. And then if you look back here, there's two options. We have open project or boot project. And really this has to do with my screen size and resolution. So you have this little pull down panel res, that's going to set the size of our actual cinematic HMI, which is going to be in this screen area. So if you have a small laptop you're running this from, you're going to leave it at the default setting of 800 by 600. So in that case, I can just hit boot project and she's going to fire right up. But on mine, I can get away with going with a slightly larger resolution because I have a big 24 inch monitor. So I'm going to actually hit open project and I'm going to change this setting. Now, in the demo, because nothing ever saves, you do have to do this step every time you, you power up the machine. So going back to run, pick the machine I want to run. I'm going to press open project in the bottom of the window. It's going to launch this interim screen. You'll notice that the resolution will be 800 by 600. And then once it pops up, there we go. I can now pick a bunch of different ones. Now, if I go too big, the screen is just going to be taking up too much of my actual display. So all of my other toolbars and whatnot will have to be moved around. So I'm going to use 1024 by 768. Once I've made the pick, I hit the green cycle start button and the machine's going to fire up. All right. So while that's booting up, it takes, uh, I don't know, maybe a minute or so. We're going to jump back into the deck. So we've, we've launched the machine. It's booting up right now. Once it's fired up, now you're going to see the full environment. So if you're familiar with CineTrain, which it's, you know, we've had that product out for quite some time. So I would expect a lot of you have probably used it before. The big difference between my virtual machine and CineTrain is that whole 3D side. We never had the 3D side. It was the one thing we were always missing inside of CineTrain was the ability of really seeing what's the actual behavior of the machine tool outside of our simulator or stuff like that, right? Our, our graphics within the standard control. So that's what it gets you. Oh, uh, she's popping up on me. Let me switch back. Sorry. So when I have this, I can now start to manipulate the 3D space. And I'm going to do that with these couple icons you see here. Um, so I have this layer icon. So I can turn like on and off the sheet metal, on and off this little um, this little icon that shows me where my mounting point for my work holding is. And I can also use this one button, to the commanded button, to minimize or maximize the screen. So there's a whole toolbar I can access. So you just got to kind of get used to these couple little navigational steps. So let's fire up the machine. So here I am. Um, now that I'm in it, I can kind of rotate my machine around move it around. Now this is a live machine and it's going to work just like my real machine tool works. So here I have my machine control panel. I'm in jog right now. I see that right there in jog. 
you know, maybe I'll go to the work coordinate system. So when I power it up, I'm going to give it some overrides. I'm going to give it my enables. Uh, I am going to turn on my axis level to three. So those those couple steps you always do whenever you power it up. So click on the, the green start spindle and the feed start. Those allow you to, to do those commands. Put your little axis mode to three here. You can crank up your overrides. And now I can actually start to jog my machine. So if I look through the window, you can see the head is actually moving around. Now, if I want to kind of get a little bit more visibility, that's where you'd use this little layer button. I click on the layers. I can turn off the housing. Now I can really start to see even better what's going on in the environment. Um, I usually will turn off this little offset because now that I know that's where the main zero is, I'm good to go. And then if I, I'm going to try to get my panel a little wider here, but if not, I'll just have to scroll to it. Yeah, you see there, real estate is a premium. There we go. It's not too bad. So you see on the far corner, and I can scroll over, that's where you get this minimize and maximize button. And that's going to give us additional toolbars to kind of work within this software. All right. So there are a bunch of preset demos. I'm going to show you one real quick, just so you can see that there's some stuff you can fool around with. And then we're going to actually go through the steps of bringing in a legit program, setting it up, running it, and evaluating it. Um, so here we're going to we're going to load up the actual um, example setup. Uh, you can go in and kind of move it around in place if you need to. Once it's loaded, then we can go and run it. Um, and then we'll we'll look at a, a full-blown example. So I get to my uh, available setups by clicking that minimize maximize button. So I see the lower toolbar and then I want to hit the setup button. When you go to setup, you're going to see there's some setups here. Now keep in mind, this is the brand new state that this was booted up. So this is always here. So whenever you power up a machine, you're always going to have these available. So if you, maybe you're a salesman and you want to use this to just demo the product for customers, this is a great way to do it. You don't have to do anything fancy. You can use the demos here. I think this gives more than enough for somebody to kind of see the power and capability of it. But then for a user like myself, then I might want to go one step further and start importing and, and doing custom setups. So you just double click until you see the, the work component come up on the table. All right, there it is on the table. If I'm happy with it, just hit machine. And it's going to go back to this view. Now, a lot of people think when they're in the setup that this is a live view. So if you start moving the machine, why isn't it moving? This is really just a static image. You have to click out to machine and now I'm back to the live actual machine. So that's just a quick little image reference to show you what it's going to look like when you come out to here. Now from there, if I want to actually run this demo, so if I was watching what I did, I can see the example name was number one. So that's important because now if I go over to Program Manager, so in our control, you need to get to the Program Manager area. You can do that with either the shortcut vertical keys on the left side of your screen. The middle one says program manager, or you can hit our menu select key. Menu select is always this position right here. Currently it has an M in it. Doesn't matter what is there. That is the menu select key. And that's going to give you soft key equivalents. And you see program manager here. You get to it either way. It doesn't matter, but select program manager. And when you come in, you're now looking at the internal memory, what we call NC. And you have three folders. Now, part programs, sub programs have nothing in them. Workpiece, however, if I double click on it, you get five different folders. These are five different things you can do. Um, so, 01 is the one we set up. If I double click on 01, now we can get into the setup. So, what you have here, let me jump back to our slide. What you have here under this folder is a couple drawings for you. So you can see what the geometry of the part we're about to make looks like. You have another PDF that shows you what your setup is, how far the workpiece is off the table. And then there's a part program. That's your MPF file. 
See how the name that's highlighted in gray here says MPF? That's the program you're going to run. So if you want to just kind of demo it a little bit, just go to example one. You can select the execute button or you can open the file and then hit the execute button on the lower corner. Either one does the same thing. What they do is they put you to auto mode. See how this now says auto here. Even our button on our machine control panels highlighted auto. Puts the program into memory. So all I have to do is hit the machine cycle start button right on the bottom of your screen next to cycle stop. And now it's off and running. So here it's going to run the demo. So the speed at which the software runs, um, it is dependent on kind of the, uh, the demand on the computer. I tend to find when I do these presentations because of the streaming, it does slow everything down. So right now I'm running right around a one-to-one, -one, meaning, you know, let's say I was running 100 inches per minute, then it would take the same amount of time for this to run. Typically what I find is um, usually this is running 300 to 400%. So three to four times over your no normal cycle speed. Now what you can do, if you're not too worried about actual true cycle times, you just wanna prove out your job, you can even use our dry run function. I have to be in single block to get dry run to trigger. Give me one sec. Come on. There we go. Uh, once you turn on dry run, now I can take single block off, cycle start, and she will run a lot faster. So I can speed up the motion if I want. Um, but what you'll be able to do is, is run a part, and then this would be what the real machine tool would do. So this would be my, my digital environment. All right. So this is running a simple shop mill program. Um, certainly I could then go and write my own, but let's take a look at maybe something a little more interesting for those of us that are actual you know, machinists or you know, manufacturers, CAD CAM programmers, whatnot. If I want to use this to prove out code that was written externally. So I'm going to shut the machine off. Maybe I'll just wrap the machine to a safe spot. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually set up um, oh, before I was going to do that, I was going to show you guys the collision monitoring piece of it. So this is one of the big benefits to the software. If the machine gets into a situation where it thinks something within the tool, the holder, the head, something collided, what it's going to do is it's going to show me a red display at the time, but during the program, it's going to keep on running. So I don't want this to stop like uh, collision protection on the real machine would, but what the system will do now as I get different conditions, I'm going to slow it down. As I'm in motion, you see when I get close, it's going to go orange. Yeah, let's see if I can get it right on that edge. You can just see kind of flash orange for a sec. That's when I'm within a gap distance. Once it goes red, I'm touching. So all these collisions that are occurring in the background are being stored for me to evaluate later. And they're being stored under this collisions tab, right? So we have to be in the maximize, minimize. I want to be in the minimize state. And I want to see the collision button. So here you see you'll start to get a list of all the collisions. And then you can click on them. And then it'll pop up a graphic so I can see where it was. Um, get a little, little time stamp, date stamp, so I can get some better idea of where it thinks the machine crashed. So the intended use case would be run your job, get all the way through it, then go and evaluate it and see, okay, this was a little close. Maybe I'm going to clip the fixture. I need to address that. Um, or maybe it's not an issue because you know you're going to do something a little different when you get to the real machine. But this is how your collision detection or collision monitoring, um, not collision avoidance, right? So it's just monitoring and detecting where potential collisions could be. This is kind of how that mechanism works. Okay, so now I do want to get us into the live example of the part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of step you through the process I would take if I was machining um, using an external cam system. 
Uh, this case, I happen to use Mastercam. We could do the exact same processes with NX for sure or any other CAM system. But I will have programmed already in that environment. And then I want to go through the steps to then duplicate that setup in this, this digital world, right? In this little sandbox of the Cinemaric Run My Virtual Machine software. So we're going to go through how do I get models in there? How do I build it? How do I bring my programs in? And then what do I what do I do? How do I how do I set this all up? Okay. So first step is probably going to want to get rid of the job I have currently set up on the machine. So to remove a working job, you're just going to go back to this setup window. And you're just going to hit the X for the one setup that's here. And that's going to clear my table just as if I grabbed an I grabbed a adjustable wrench and unbolted my curve vise and pulled it off the table. Um, I don't really care about what's in the spindle right now. That's going to come out later when I build up some tools. So now I have a couple options. Um, first, bringing programs in and out. So the simplest way um, in this environment would be to use a USB stick to kind of bring bring things in and out of the software. Um, so the software itself was intended to kind of be like a, an island, just like the machine tool would be. So the transmission process would mimic that. So what I did for this event is I've previously set up a USB stick I have, and in here I have my part program. So this is the program as I posted out of Mastercam, right? So there it is. Nothing's been set up right now. Uh, if I was to simulate this job right now, it's going to yell at me and tell me the tools haven't been set up, right? I haven't done anything. It's just sitting there posted on the USB stick. Now, the I could certainly run and edit and do everything I want to do from the USB stick, or I could move it into NC memory. So I'm going to move it over just to show you that a little different process. So I'm going to copy the part program, and now I'm going to go to NC. I'm going to put it in part programs. I'm going to hit paste. So there is my file in and ready to run. Now, the next thing I noticed when I simulated it, I don't have any tools, right? I got to build up my tools. So with the Siemens certified Mastercam post, what we have Mastercam do is we have them output all of my tool names or numbers right here in the header of the program. So this just makes setup kind of quick and easy. So if you're working with a post, team, post developer, I would strongly adopt this process. Now you don't have to use tool names. I certainly like to, because I like to know, hey, this is a 12 millimeter end mill. I see it in the name. Um, some guys like tool one, tool two, tool three. That's okay. You would still get a listing here of those, of the tools so you can still build them. So if I want to build this tool real fast, I'm just going to copy the name. I'm going to jump over to my tool list. Now, this is going to work just like my real machine. So go to either an unloaded spot or go to an empty pocket, create a new tool. Mine's an end mill. Give it the name. Give it some kind of length. Here, if I knew the gauge length in Mastercam or whatever cam system I'm in, I would certainly want to maybe put it in here. Give it my tool radius. Uh, maybe number of flutes. Maybe I'm programming feed per tooth. We do need to do that for two tools because this job has some milling and some drilling. So let me copy the next one. All right, we're going to grab a twist drill. I want to paste in the name again. So you see, having all those names right in the header, man, it does make things super simple. Um, you could even, if the gauge line lengths and everything are critical, have them put that information there too. I mean, the more you have to you know in the same spot right at the beginning the, the easier it makes to kind of work with this and it helps when you got on the machine i would do the exact same process on the machine so now at this point i should be able to at least simulate the job so let's go to 100 percent. we can see a little motion so this is going to work like sinew train did right this would be how what everything sinew train could let me do uh, and we do also sell a version of this software uh, minus the 3D called operate. And that would be really everything to the left side of the 3D you would get. So really be the same thing as Sinew Train. Now looking at it, looks like my part. Not quite sure why the tool is down there, but eh, everything looks okay. So at this point, normally I would say, yeah, I'm good. We can kind of move to the next step. 
but I have this whole 3D piece. So I want to take advantage of that and make sure that what she's about to run is going to be good when I get to the machine, right? So now I want to bring over and set up this environment. Um, doesn't matter where I leave my HMI at this point. We're going to work on the 3D side. So if I want to create setups and not use an existing setup like in here, I'm going to go to my library tab. And under library, I can click on my existing setups and see them all here. Or I can go to new library element setup and then build a setup here. Now, I can use primitives to just throw a blank up on the table and start to cut off that. But if I want to bring things in from an external source, I can import them as either step files or STL files. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, before we do anything, we're going to jump over to our CAM system. And let me get down to it. Boom. And what I want to do is I want to take this job. So I got a nice little fifth axis self-centering vice. I have my final part. What I did was I had also modeled my stock. So there's my stock. And what I need to do is really, I want to grab the vice, the work holding, and I want to grab the stock. Um, I don't really need the part because the part's going to get made when it machines it, right? Now, what's nice about with this is now I can use any crazy irregular shaped stock and I'm going to see what it's going to do to that stock. Um, traditional simulation like we were just in just has some basic primitives. Um, so I can't do you know, any irregular stock. Now, inside of Mastercam, a nice quick way for me to export these items is I want to use under file the function called save sum. And by picking save sum, I can now click certain entities. Now, one thing to note, you see where my global zero is? I want to use that and kind of build everything off the global zero. So my part zero is actually up on top of the part. Uh, I did that by using a plane here, top part zero. But my global zero down there is the bottom center. And that's going to relate to the connection point on my machine in the software. So I don't really have to think about anything. It's all going to go exactly where I want to, as long as I've preset the base zero to be the bottom of the fixture. OK, once you have your fixture selected, I'm going to select them separately here. So I'm going to end my selection. And now I can save it. And this is where the USB comes in super handy. It's just quick and easy to drop it right down to the same folder and give it some kind of name. So I'm going to call this uh, Vice. It's a lack of better to do. And I do want to export it as either a step or an STL. So I'll do this one as a step, the next one as an STL, so you can kind of see both of them. So that's going to port out the work holding. Now I just jump back to save some, click on the blank. Here, I'm going to put it in the same spot, just dump it right on my USB, this folder I already have preset. Uh, maybe in this case, we'll do an STL. I'll call this my stock or my blank or oops, whatever I want to call it. All right, save that. So now it's put both components uh, onto the USB stick. So jump over to run my virtual machine. In the library, I want to click new library element. And I want to go right to setup. So you can just build a setup. And then what it's going to do is it's not only going to build the setup, it's going to make those items also available in my library for future use, which is kind of nice. So go to setup. I can give it anything, any name I want. So I'll call it setup one cam demo, right? Anything, anything you want to call it. Now, I usually will bring in my vice first. It really makes no difference. To me, it makes a little more sense because I would mount the vice before I would mount the stock. Um, so I'm going to click on this import because I know I don't have them in my library yet. So click on import. You can browse anywhere you want. Um, I like to keep everything on the USB stick. So I just browse to my USB stick, pick my stock. So this is my step file. And now it's going to bring up a little pop-up viewer and allow me to pick if I had multiple components. Oops, I picked the stock. I don't want the stock. I want the vice. 
So let me do that again. Click Vice. It'll pop up a little viewer. So if there were a bunch of different components in there, I could pick them individually. In this case, I'm just going to click on the one vice, add it in as a protection area, and say import. Now, if I look in the window here, now it is showing me where the vice would be sitting on the table. You'll see it better once I come out of this full screen. Now we bring in our stock or our blank. So I'm going to do the same thing with this upper button. I'm going to pick it. I'm going to go right down to my USB, pick my stock. I want to pick that one. So you always have to highlight the item you want to bring in, say add selected item, and then import. Once they're both there, just hit save setup. It's going to bring me out. Now you see I have an additional setup right here in the library. Now it hasn't mounted it to the machine yet. I do have to then go back to the setup on the lower toolbar. You'll see now mine exists. So double click. It's going to position, and that's where that base offset came in. It's going to position that at where this little, um, the little uh, UCS, that, that bubble that we showed earlier, that's where it's going to mount that vice initially. So here I can kind of see it's going to drop it right on the center of my table. You can move it around, you know, if I wanted for any reason to shift the vise 100 millimeters over, I could do that, or I could shift my stock, you know, you just pick up what you want to shift, and then they move. There's a way to connect them. I did do a previous webinar or an earlier webinar um, on a lot more detail in this area, so you may want to check it out. Uh, here I just want to show you what you can and can't do in the demo version, really. So I'm not going to do any offset changes. I'll leave everything at zero. All right, and we'll put that back. All right, everything's lined. I say save changes, click on machine. Once I see that green pop up. So now it is loaded. So now this machine, machine zero, if I was to look back, at my machine is roughly the center of its travel. So if I position the machine to zero, zero, just to give you some reference, you see that it's sitting right there in the center. And since I worked from the middle, that really means that I don't have to do anything to set up my X and Y at this point. So how do I set up my Z? Because my Z is going to need some kind of offset. So in this case, there's two ways. Um, I could certainly... Um, doo -doo -doo. Do I have a work offset set? That's weird. Why is my zero not my zero? Oh, G55 is loaded. So I do need to go to G54 because this part's going to use G54. So let's do that. G55 is loaded from our last example we ran. So now if I position the machine, I noticed that because she should have been sitting right in the center of my part. See so how now the tool is really dead center in the part, right? Okay. So how do I find the top? Well, quick down and dirty method would be to use my, my collision now. Remember, it goes red to touch the top of my workpiece. So crank your override down, slowly jog down onto the part until it goes red. I'm going to back up a little bit. Let me get it right when it turns red. Oh, there's my orange thread. Man, I am close. I would believe that's close enough. So this is a quick down and dirty, just like if I was on a machine with a little piece of paper, right? Um, so I can set my work offset for Z. Um, X and Y, again, don't need to be set. Good. So now I'm, I'm pretty good. I should be close to running this part. And it doesn't matter which tool I used. I used the previous 16 millimeter tool from the last job. Um, because it knows that length. So I'm just really establishing the top of the work piece. So go back to the program. We have tools, we have a zero, we should be ready to run. So now we'll go to execute. Now I'm going to leave dry run on just for time's sake. And I'm going to hit cycle start. And now it's going to run my job. So certainly if I want, if you wanted to, you could have the housing on. You could have that little datum on showing you where the zero is. Now, in this case, you see how it's going orange? 
So when this model was built, they set a set gap distance and we're right on the edge of the gap distance. So it's saying, the orange says, you're not hitting, you're just close, just pay attention. And I would say I'm kind of close. So that's somewhat valid. So there we're, we're rolling around, cutting the part. You can deactivate if you want, and then it would not give you any detection. So that's, you know, if it's, if you get a lot of these and you know that they're, they're just warnings and it's nothing I have to be concerned with because it's not red, that's fine. Here she's going to go up and do its tool change. Come on over. Tool change, tool change. And then, uh oh, well, that's a problem. So, what happened there? I am I now smashed through my part where graphically everything looked okay. Well, what's happening here, and we can jog her out if we want, get her in a clearance point. If I look at the program, the program set up a safe retraction point at machine zero to be zero, zero, zero. Now, if you remember, XY is the center of the table, so that was fine. But on this machine, they set the top of the spin of the machine table to be Z0. So this would cause a crash. And actually, that's why I saw the tool where it was at the end of the simulation. But it's a little harder to kind of discern that from the graphics. Here, it's pretty obvious. I get a big old crash. So what I can do is I can now pick a safe retract spot. So maybe I jog the Z up. Now, when you're figuring out a retract, you want to look at this without any offsets in play. So you look at your machine coordinate system. So probably 640 would be off the limit. You know, maybe I even want to kind of get the table forward for a loading or unloading position. So here, maybe 280 in my, my Y, right, would be good. So now I could go into the program. And if this was a real one-to-one, -one, then I would have to do the exact same thing for the real machine. So I said, uh, what did I say, 320, I think, something like that. So now I can do my update. If I want to rerun, I can let it run right over top of the cut part. If you want to refresh the model, hit the reset workpiece, say yes, model refreshes, cycle start. And now we can make sure that everything's safe and happy at this stage. Crank overrides all the way to the top. If I don't want to see these detections, I can shut off the, the part real fast. It doesn't want me to do it while it's running. I can deactivate the simulation or the uh, collision detection. Now we can run again. You see, she, she'll roll off faster too when it's not continuing to warn you. Oops, I think there's a spot where I'm clipping. This one will be pretty obvious because if it's right, then the head won't be shoved in the part. If I'm wrong, then the head will still be in the part. So let's get down through it. So she's machining around. So I do see a bunch of, um, of questions popping up in the chat. That's great. Um, we will do a Q&A period at the end uh, and dig into all of your questions for sure. So if you have any questions, um, put it either in the chat or in the questions tab. Either one we will go through. Okay, so there you go. Now I'm in a, a retract point in Z, loading point in the X. So that was all controlled. So those are the things that you can really start to see now when I visualize this environment. Okay, so we did a lot of steps. Now this is the downfall with demo. The minute I hit that X or this X, Everything I did is gone. I would have to reset it all up again. It wasn't that many steps. I could certainly go through that um, relatively minimal, but you know, maybe there was four or five, six tools I just created. Maybe I had a couple vices in. So we do give you a way to um, save your data and kind of bring it back in. There we go. Um, to recover. So I'm going to show you uh, how to recover. Um, oh, this was just building the primitive like I showed you. So I was a little bit ahead of myself. So I'm going to show you how to export and then re-import 
after I've completely wiped out the machine. So it's a little bit quicker for you to get back to where you were if there is something you're working on and you do need to shut the software down. Certainly you can keep the software up days on end if you like, and then at that point you wouldn't have to rebuild. I would still go through this process. So what we're gonna do two steps. First, I'm gonna show you what to create. So there's three files you need to create. You need to export your 3D environment. So that's pretty simple. You need to export or save your part programs. So yes, I could have just copied it and dropped it on the USB, but I'm gonna show you this cool generate archive. Maybe some of you haven't seen that. It's a quick way to get lots of programs in and out in just a couple of clicks. And then we're gonna save the tooling data. Um, now it is important, you should get in the habit of clearing the spindle before you make this table and then reread it in. Um, it will work otherwise, but it's not a great habit to get in. So I would say clear your spindle. Once we've made these three files, then next we're gonna show you the equivalent loading in of the three files. So just a slightly different process. And then we should be back to running. So let's do it. Let's try to, as we would like to say, toaster this machine. <laughs> All right. So remember, three main files or environments I need to save. So first on the 3D side, I want to make sure that I've hit the minimum maximize button. So my toolbars are up. And I want to click on the little gear. That's our setup area. And in here, you see right there in the center of the screen, there's import and export. So you're going to export everything that's here. Don't even worry about it. Just say export. Point it to that USB stick. Give it a name that you'll remember. So I'm going to say this is my 3D. So I know, okay, that's my 3D data. And just hit save. So it's going to happen pretty quick. You probably see that little uh, blue, you know, time circle spinning. It's going to pop up the green message when it's successfully done. So we've now effectively backed up whatever was done in here. So really what that is, is that's this whole work holding, um, the vice being in my library and the blank being in my library. Had I also decided to, you know, modify the tool at all, you know, I can bring in, I can import holders just like you were seeing with the vices, bring them in as step files. I could bring in custom inserts. I mean, you can do crazy stuff here. Um, this would all get backed up as well. So really the entire 3D environment is in that file. Now on the HMI or the CNC side, I'm now going to go first to jog because I did say I want to clear my spindle. So I'm going to do just a simple tool zero. Gets the tool out of being in the spindle. Once the tool's removed, see now it's blank. I don't even see it there in 3D. Now I go over to program manager like we were before. And like I said, I certainly could just drop that same one. But let's say we had, just for example's sake, we had additional files in here. And I wanted to save all of those files. Maybe it's a main program with subprogram calls. So if I'm on the primary folder, what I can then do now is I can expand my vertical soft keys till I see an archive button. And in archive, I can generate an archive. And what that's going to do is going to give me a compressed file wherever I tell it to put it. I'm going to put it right there. A uh, name is going to be part programs, let's say. I mean, call it anything you want, it's something you'll remember. But now this will give you a single file that contains everything in that folder. So if I did work pieces, I would have literally gotten all of these subfolders and all the files within the subfolders. So it's a quick, simple way for you to move data in and out. And this works the same way on the real machine. So you can make archives and you can export complete libraries of all your programs. All right. And then the last thing I want to do is I want to save the tools. Now, I need this save setup button to go black. It's gray right now. You can't save the setup in subprograms or work pieces, but you can save it subprograms or part programs, but you can save it anywhere else. So like you see, if I go down here, this goes black. Where I want to save is on my USB stick again. So go to USB, be in your folder, say save setup data. It'll always give you a TMZ extension for tool management, right? That's your little indicator. I want to make sure I save all of my tools and I want to make sure I save all of my work offsets. 
And that's going to give me everything in the offset table that I changed. So remember, I built two tools. I also adjusted the work offset earlier. Now that it's all been made, we can kill the system and recover it. So everything I need is sitting on my USB stick. So that's all good. So I'm just going to shut everything down. It's going to launch back out. And then I'm going to bring it back in. So once we're out, we'll relaunch. And then while it's relaunching, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that Z work offset. So we had came down and we had measured it. I'm going to show you a little trick. So here, I'm going to relaunch this machine. So remember, I want to go open project because I need to reset the res. I don't get to save anything. So there's a couple of things you're going to have to get used to resetting each time you power up. Well, once she comes up, and then I'm going to hit the power on, and it's going to start booting. So while it's booting, one of the things I like to do, because my connection point was mimicked in my cam system, you know, we came down with a tool and touched off the top of the part. On these machines, since machine zero is the bottom, what I really needed to know was the distance from the bottom of this vise to the top of the workpiece. So you could actually measure it right here. So I can go to analyze, measure that edge, maybe measure this edge. And if you look at the, the, the straight length down, it's 86 millimeters. So when we reload, we'll go and take a look at, uh, at the value that got computed there and see where that, that stands for for the distance but usually I'll, I'll i'll never even have to touch it i just measure quickly what's my stack height and i can put that right into my machine environment so let's see where we are so she's coming up right now so as it boots up it's back to the state that we were in when we first loaded it and then we're going to have to give our enables um, once the hmi is up you can actually start working with it prior even to the 3D because they are kind of independent. So here I could turn on my overrides. You see how the numbers start changing. I can give it my enables. I give it my access level. So you always got to do those. Now here we are back in the environment. And if I look, I look for my stuff now, right? Maybe I go to my library. I got no vice, no, vi no extra vice here. This is just the examples that were in it, right? I go to my program manager, no programs and part programs, right? I go to my tool list, no new tools that I built down here. So this is where we then reload all the data. Doesn't make any difference what I load first. Um, let's say I do the 3D first. I want to go to the same settings, but now I want to hit the import button. Just go right back to your USB. There's your zip. 3D zip that we made, click open, say yes. So that's going to bring all of the 3D stuff back in. So when we're all said and done, we should have the vice, the blank, the setup should now be available to us because it got saved. Now it backed it up with also all the sample programs. So they, they come right back in. So they're still there. Had I deleted those before I made that file, then they would be gone. So we come out, we go to library. Oh, there's our cam demo from earlier. Great. I can drop it back on my table. So now I have to bring the program in. So go to Program Manager. Now remember, nothing's in part programs currently. You go over to USB, open up your folder, and you're finding the ARC file, right? Part Program ARC. Now, when it's an ARC, it's smart enough to give you this read in button. Or I could expand, go to the archive button and use this read in. They do the exact same thing. But what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to, oops, what's going on there? Our program, read in. Uh, oh, I have to highlight it. Uh, you do have to pick it again in this browse. Boom, there you go. So now it reads it in, read it in successfully. So if we go to NC, there you go. There's the file, the file with the edits I made, right? Because that was all done prior to me exporting it. Um, we also 
have that other program that has nothing in it I just made. So that's a simple way to get multiple files to get pulled in. Now the save setup data, all you have to do with that one, the INI file is come in here and just open it as if you were opening a part program. So I can hit this little arrow or I can hit the open button and that will initiate the loading process. And this is the same thing on your real machine. Just keep in mind, this is gonna wipe out the entire tool management and rebuild it to whatever's in this file. So if, you know, tools have moved to different pockets, um, be very careful with that process on the real machine because you could get things mixed up. But this is a great way to create a snapshot of your setup. Um, if you're doing it as just a backup of all your tools, and you know that this may only be recovered somewhere down the road. Um, one of the options there was to save the tools without tool locations. And that way it would actually build all the tools in an unloaded state. And then you could reconfigure um, your tool system and just you know load your tools into the recording pockets and all that kind of stuff. But here in this environment, I'm just going to let it come in. Uh, this one probably takes the longest of all of them because it is going and recreating all of these tools. So the more tools that are in there, the longer it would take. Uh, we just let it kind of go down through the system. And then once it's all said and done, we will then see our two tools are back as well as the offset. And there we can even see what offset number it measured when I touched it off relative to the value I saw in CAD, like I was showing you guys. But I do have to let it finish that load. Now I go to my tool list. You see, up oh, there's my two tools are back. My work offset is back and up, oh, there you go. So I measured 86 mil. When I came down and touch, it measured 85.997 or 977. So that was that little bit difference of the collision. Uh, but at this point you are completely set up again. So if I wanted to run the job, I could go back to execute, go back to auto, and I am back to where I was. So that's a simple way for you to be able to kind of recover things um, and get back to running. Um, certainly, you know, if you start to see a lot of value in this and you're using this day to day, I think you'll quickly realize it would probably be worth getting the full license, but it is a great way for you guys to start working with it. Also, as I said earlier, perfect for, you know, simple demonstration of those um, those template examples that were in there um, if you're, you know, using it more as a sales tool. Okay. So now, with that being said, let's just go back in to our slides real quick. Uh, inch mode. Oh, I did want to show you guys how to use the system in inch mode. So everything we did was in metric. Uh, you are not limited to metric, but there is an extra couple steps if you want to run the system an inch. And you would have to always do this switch whenever you power the system up. So we, we changed the unit of measure like we would on the real control. So we go to jog, we go to settings, and then we change over to inch. But we also need to cycle the power of 3D because it will be scaling wrong. And I'll show you what I mean uh, in a second. So if I'm back here in the 3D environment and I now want to set the machine up for inch mode, right? So I go to jog. Well, I'm in jog. There I am in jog. I want to expand my keys over. I want to go to settings. And I want to hit this change over to inch. So see how this says millimeters right now? Click change over. This is the same way you would do it on the real machine. When it's done, it says inch. So everything's back an inch. If I go to my tools, now all my values are inch values. But watch what happens if I make a tool right now. So I'll just call this cutter half inch, right? Whatever I want to call it. So we're going to say that this is a four inch gauge length, quarter inch radius, two fluter, whatever. Now I'm going to go tool change this tool. All right, let's go to TSM. Select, cycle start. So I look initially, and I think, well, there's no tool. There is actually a tool. <laughs> it just is tiny. <laughs> look at, there's your tool. Because that switch switched over the control, but nothing rescaled this software. You know, had I, 
know, maybe for argument's sake, I was going to my library, I was going to create a new, uh, new blank, right? I'm going to make it from a primitive. You see how everything still says metric? So you do have to cycle power. Now be careful here because I don't want to close the software entirely because I'm going to lose everything that I just set up. So all you need to do is just hit the red switch off. Let it come back to that previous screen where I set my screen res and you'll notice it'll maintain the setting I set earlier. So nothing's going to get lost yet. And then just hit the green power on again and that'll rescale. So now when I come back, a half inch tool will look appropriate in the spindle. Plus I can create primitives. I can actually program fully. So whether I did kick cam or at the control, I can now run it as I, as I normally would. All right. So while that's booting back up, I think I have one more slide and then we'll open up to questions. There we go. Yep. So for those of us that uh, maybe haven't had a chance to experience the full version, so what do I get once I get the full license? Well, now you can get any number of machines. Sorry, boot up, took over my screen. Um, you can get OEM specific machines, right? A lot of our top OEMs like DV, like like uh, DNS, um, track machine tools for argument's sake. You know, a lot of these guys that are moving to Cinemark 1 are building these digital twins and they're putting a lot of work into these things. You'll be able to have them run them, but you need the full version. Um, you can do full probing. Um, this machine I have set up not only does part programming, probing, I can do tool probing. So for training purposes, you know, you can actually step through the entire steps a user would use on the real machine right here in the virtual. So there, there's a lot of value there, um, I, I would say. So that's some of the stuff you're gonna start to get, uh, full access to all the machines and the template machines. Um, but you know, start with a demo. Um, what's it What's it take? A couple steps to bring the software down, install it and start playing with it. So here, just one last look. So now you see my half inch tool is back and my spindle. Um, all the offsets got adjusted, right? So the top of this part is still set. Um, it's just now set in the equivalent inch value, right? So it did the math. So just to show you real quick, if I wanted to, I could go in, we'll create a new shop mill program. We'll call this inch test. Set up my program at block centered. I know it's roughly four by four. We'll say it's one inch thick. Retract is going to be an inch. Safety is 100,000. So now I'm just putting equivalent um, inch values into a program. Maybe I'm going to mill a pocket. We'll do a simple rectangular. We'll go grab the tool that I have in the spindle. Give it some feed rates, spindle speed. We'll say the width of the pocket. I don't know. Maybe it's an inch and a half by three. Quarter inch rad. We'll do a quarter inch deep. 50% step over, sure. We'll take it all in one cut. No finish stock. And we'll come in at 50 inches a minute, let's say. Right, so I can start to build my programs. Yes, I can simulate like I normally would. But here, you can even run. So, oh, got to give it our enables. I hadn't done that yet. So you can come in and you can you know, use it in either you know, unit of measure, either environments, just in the demo, you would need to do those that, that those couple steps of switching the unit of measure because it always boots in metric and then cycling the 3D. Um, once you certainly have a full license, then you can save the state and then it would come up to that every time. Okay, so let me go back to here. And Dan, I think it's time that we open up for some Q&A. All right. I've been answering a few of them in the chat. So we had a few of them, you know. Perfect. Is, is uh, I think we could just kind of hit some of these really quickly. Yep. Uh, is it rebranded uh, Siemens VNCK? So... Is it rebranded? Okay, so I think what we have to uh, um, define is what do we mean by VNCK? So VNCK is what we call our virtual NC kernel. That's what VNCK stands for. 
VNCK um, can be licensed and used on all kinds of pieces of software. So Run My Virtual Machine is absolutely using VNCK. It is using our virtual NC kernel. Sinutrain used VNCK. But we had also, and this is where kind of things got confusing, we had also used it to be able to drive simulation engines and like NX for argument's sake, and we just called that VNCK. Um, but really VNCK is the virtual NC kernel that could be used in all kinds of pieces of software. So is this VNCK? Yes, but is this different as far as the NX? Well, the difference is we're not driving an NX model, we're driving a third party, you know, that other that other model. We do have a new solution in NX. Uh, we call it NX My Virtual Machine, and it's still using all that same technology. So keep in mind, this product you saw is designed and released for the Cinemark One control. Hence why we kind of changed our branding a little bit. Cool. And now we had a, does it work with standalone or do you need an X? So we just meant answered that question yeah. too as well. So this was the standalone but you do, we do also have a solution that rides with inside of NX, so you can get either one. So I would say, you know, if you, you are an NX user, uh, personally, I would want to stay in my NX environment the whole time. And I have an NX version, and when I'm programming in NX, I use the my virtual machine for NX. It just makes sense to stay in the environment. What I like the, the standalone package like we just used here for is if I'm not programming in NX, right? Um, NX is a great package, but there's times that there's, you know, tool paths that I want to run from Mastercam, or I just have users that are using Mastercam or Fusion or any of the number of great CAM systems out there. So there, the standalone gives all of those platforms a chance to still get the same level of quality of simulation and accuracy of simulation as we would in the NX uh, VNCK version, or now what we call NX My Virtual Machine. Nice. So we got that one. Um, do you need a separate license to bring in actual machine archives? Okay, so um, right now we don't have it released yet for loading in uh, machine archives. You would need the full create version. Remember I said there's those two versions, um, but we are adding that functionality to run. Um, since it hasn't been released, I can't say for sure, but from what I understand, um, you will not need an additional license. The normal run license should give you that activity. But again, I won't be 100% sure until they release it. That should be coming out, I think, pretty soon, uh, like maybe within the next six months. I know they've been working on uh, getting it released. We're trying to get back to the functionality we had in Sinutrain for that process. Cool. One of the questions here says, I know you can transfer Sinutrain licenses from 4.5 to 4.7. Is it possible to transfer a license to this new version with Sim? Uh, no. So they are treated as two completely different products. Um, also from the licensing mechanism, the licenses are different actually. So Sinutrain used a kind of a floating hidden encrypted file that you would just copy from a USB stick, put it on your PC, and then you could move that license around. Um, this software, we adopted the same licensing mechanism that NX uses and our software side uses, uh, where it's a file, um, but effectively it's linked to a specific piece of hardware in your PC. So that was like when I showed you that little pull down, I had to pick the adapter. Later, I want to make sure that adapter is picked properly once I get a full license because it's going to be your license is going to be looking to say, hey, do I have this piece of hardware? And if I don't, the license isn't going to work. So it's going to be tied to that specific machine. Nice. And is the NX virtual machine only available for 840 and Cinemark 1? So, um, that's a that's a tricky tricky topic. Uh, commercially, from a headquarters perspective, they say that it only is designed for those two controls. However, in reality, um, you can absolutely build one from an eight twenty eight. Um, you know, normally they say the Sinutrain is is the intended piece of software for the eight twenty eight digital twin. I would say if you have an environment where you're you want to have you know, 840s or Cinemark 1s and 828s in the same environment, yes, that is possible. Oh my God, is it possible to connect a PLC SIM instance to the simulation? 
Um, yeah, I think you would use, uh, what do we call that? Isn't that the virtual SIMIC controller? I think it allows you to do that. There is, I don't get into those details. That would be a better question for um, our colleague, Brian Baumgartner. Um, but you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. We're actually looking at right now, taking a machine control panel, a physical machine control panel, bringing it in through uh, Profinet and driving the virtual twin from a physical panel. You can do that. Um, you can have, you have full PLC running. You know, that's really the big difference here. My virtual machine to Sinutrain, Sinutrain had a standard watered down PLC that was always the same PLC running under every machine. So once there was something unique happening in your PLC, Sinutrain had no visibility. My virtual machine, though your PLC is running fully. So we can do a lot more there. Hopefully nice, that yeah. kind of answers the question. Installation problems for network port. Does it work if you have a, no internet connection to install, run the demo version? What version is this? No probing in the demo, correct? Okay, a couple questions. I can answer all of them. So first of all, this is not looking to hit anything look anywhere. So there is no need for any internet connection. Once you've downloaded the files, it will run anytime you boot up your PC, no matter what you have. Um, the licensing mechanism, to explain this to you a little further, once you have a license, a couple ways we can host the license. So the license could be tied to your PC, as I mentioned, once you have the license, or you can use that same license sitting on a server, but then you have to have access to the server. So the server could, in theory, be a cloud-based solution, uh, and then you just have to have access through the internet to that server, or it could be local in your company. I personally don't like to have to rely on internet access for my licenses to work. So I host my licenses locally on my PC, uh, and then they're just always there. So a couple different options. So that's the licensing. Um, uh, what version is this? The software we just showed you is 6.22. Um, it has to be 6.2.2 for the demo version. The previous versions of Run My Virtual Machine did not support the demo. It's brand new for 6.2.2. And um, I apologize. The probing does work. I didn't show you because I would have to calibrate the probe. But absolutely, if I go through the steps of calibrating the probe, the probe will absolutely work in the demo version of Run My Virtual Machine. Can you simulate a vertical turret lathe in the demo? No. So again, we're limited to the three demo machines that you saw. Can the software simulate it once you have the license? 100%. We don't have a template of a VTL, but if the OEM has built the our digital twin file is what we call a VCP file. That's the extension on it. So if you can get a VCP file of that technology, the software will absolutely show it but not in demo. Demo, you were always limited to three, and the one lathe is that horizontal uh, live tooling lathe. Nice, nice. So just have uh, maybe one or two more questions before we cut out here. It says, um, what can you tell me about the help in selling the solution to upper management? So, uh, you know, I think the, the thing that, that you're getting by moving into this concept of a digital twin is the ability of really allowing your capital equipment, your machine tools to be utilized and more effective longer. Um, you know, the key is uptime, right? We wanna be spinning that spindle as long as we can and making chips. So for me to be able to reproduce the environment and even catch something simple like that crash I just showed, boy, if I was down on the machine, that could have been a huge problem. Maybe it would have been something as simple as I just had to run up to my engineering department and tell them they have to edit the code. Maybe it's as bad as the machine just really crashed. So I, I think right there alone, you're going to be able to utilize your capital equipment much, much more effectively and, and really get the most out of that investment by taking tasks that you would have normally done while the machine was kind of sitting, waiting and just cropped it up to the setup time. And now you can do that while it's running a whole other part. That's and then also, like, like. yeah, the other thing too, we can't lose the fact of a lot of our customers like to use it also as a quoting tool. Um, 
you know, you, I didn't go down this road just for time's sake, but if I was to look at the simulation time inside of Mastercam and then inside of this software, I will see a very significant difference. I mean, I've seen 20, 30, even 40% discrepancies between the time sometimes. Um, and it's all because I need that BNC kernel, right? I need that brain of the control telling me in this simulation, how's this machine going to behave? And third-party simulation tools that don't have our brain in them, it doesn't know. So this software, NX with my virtual machine, right? They are being driven by the actual decisions that the controller makes. And that's really the key. So you will get one-to-one -one cycle times. Nice. I like that. I, I think I think I'd agree with uh, with all that. I think we have one time for one more question. How does run my virtual machine differ for other simulation softwares and products in the market? I think you kind of touched base a little bit on that, but I don't know if you want to hit a little bit more on it, that question. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of great pieces of software out there for sure. Barracut makes a great product. Uh, Predator's got some great stuff. It really comes down to how close do you want to get to a one-to-one -one of what's going to happen on the floor. And without that kernel, which what I always like to refer to as the brain of the CNC, all of these other pieces of software are just making educated guesses as to how the machine's going to respond. You know, any can cycle you run, there's logic happening in the control that those third-party simulations, they just don't know. They have no idea what the decisions the control makes. Now, in a basic 3-axis machine, it may just be the difference of, you know, a 15-minute cycle time to an estimated 10. Okay, fine. You get to five axis, it could be the dissonance of, oh, well, I spun the platter left, but mm, it really spun right on the real machine. And now I got a major crash, right? So so that's really the difference. It doesn't say that, that, stuff, that the other packages are bad. They're, they're not. But you're just going to get that much more an accurate simulation. Nice. Well, I'd like to thank everyone that is still in the webinar for coming and appreciate your time to watch this. I appreciate Chris giving the presentation on this. I think this is really kind of a cool product that you can start to use right now today to start understanding how to use cinem cinematic control and kind of prove some things out on some demo machines before you start to look at purchasing this product you know, for yourself or having a full license. So I think it's really cool. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Uh, certainly, I appreciate uh, you know everybody coming and taking time out of their busy day to, to hang out with us for a little while. Thank you. All right. With that being said, everybody have a great weekend, and we look forward to seeing you next time. All right. Yeah. Bye -bye. Absolutely. Bye.